so far, um, all of my intros have been pretty chill. And I, I actually quite like a podcast where it's not just like, boom, straight in. Yeah. I quite like a, an easy, chill sort of vibe. Um, it's, it's weird being face to face, like one on one with someone, though. It feels quite like a job interviewee. Very intense. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, you got to describe yourself. Could you describe your weaknesses to me? If I, if, what do you say in a job interview? My weakness is I care too much and I work too hard. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I'm going to use that. I'm going <laughs> to clip that. Okay. Ed Clancy, welcome to the podcast. Start Thanks for having me. Cheers, Ben. Um, holding a total of 24 medals across world champs, European champs, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games. <sighs> Something that I've forgotten. Three of which big important medals we've got here today. I hope that we'd have them right here, right now. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll, f we'll fish them out of the office later on. Yes, we'll do that. Um, basically, uh, the gist that I've got from doing a bit of research in, on you is that you're just very good at turning left. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I know you're a mountain bike background yourself, but the beautiful thing about track racing is you just go one way. Yeah. You can't get lost. Yeah. And when you fall off, there's nothing to hit. No trees. Well, you say that. I've I've spent a little bit of time in velodromes and I've seen people deck it pretty hard there, to be honest. Yeah, I, I tell you, you sort of get burnt and you get these weird little splinters that you just can't, you've got no idea where they come from. But when you fall off doing 40 odd mile an hour, yeah. you slide for a long way. That's the first thing you notice. Um, the next thing you notice is you sort of resemble a porcupine. You've got little things sticking out of your arms and legs and yeah, it's um, could be worse though. Mm. It's not downhill mountain biking, is it? No, no, that's far more brutal when you get it <laughs> wrong there. Um, okay, so first, most important question I thought we'd start off with, the, the tricky ones. Um, cat people versus dog people. Ooh. Is there a difference? It's a tell you what's an important question. Um, hey, look, man, I don't like division. Um, I think you can love both. I love both. I like cat people and dog people. I like cats and dogs. I just think we can learn a lot from cats. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like people yeah. praise like the, the loyalty of a dog. The thing is with a cat, you've got to earn a cat's loyalty. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you give a cat a crap time, it'll just move in next door. Yeah. People can learn from that. Do you know what I mean? It's true. Don't put up with too much crap. So, so I actually, like uh, the, the reason I asked that is when I look at your social media, your cat it features quite heavily, I think. Yeah. He's like my little boy, you know. I mean, I don't have kids. And um, What's his name? He called him Boris, but not for that reason. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, I, I picked a funny name for a, a daft little orange cat. Yes. Boris is what we landed with. But um, I tell you what, he's been the best 40 quid I've ever spent. <laughs> Honestly, it's like, you know, for, he costs less than half as much as a, a mountain bike tire these days. And he's been such a great little addition to my life. He knocks around and, you know, makes the house a home. No. Scratches the cat tree and the sofas now and again. Ruin the kitchen chairs. But apart from that. He's mint. Our, our dog was a lockdown purchase and yeah. uh, he was outrageously expensive. I, I'm not even going to say what he cost, but I did haggle him and I said to, <laughs> <laughs> I said to my girlfriend, we're going to put an offer in and if the farmer doesn't accept it, we're not having him. And uh, it turned into a haggle. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, pulling on the heartstrings and then when you, there's money involved as well, it's, uh, it's a tricky... <laughs> Yeah, and he turned out to be a good trail dog then. Very good trail dog. Um, although Blake Sampson would disagree with that because when I don't, we were out in Selback a, a year ago, I don't know if you met. Did you meet my dog out there or not? I didn't meet your dog, no. I met no. Blake. But, um. so, <laughs> so I mistakenly decided to. Um, so Hank and Blake were doing a, a, a race down one of the tracks where Blake rode a, um, a gravel bike. I remember this, yeah. And Hank yeah. rode a, just a mountain bike, a trail bike. Yeah. And I, I basically heard from Hank that we were going to, we were just going to go and film a top to bottom run. So he said, can you just come up with us? Just get one drone shot, like, and just follow us as far as you can. We're going to go top to bottom. That's it. Yep. Great. No problem. So I thought, okay, I'll bring the, my bike and my drone in the rucksack and I'm going to bring the dog up with me because I'm literally going to park on the side of the trail in one location and then they're going to come buzzing past and then that's it. And I can just go and do my own thing with the dog and spend however long I need to just get on the trails with him. <clears throat> yeah. It ended up turning into just stop, start all the way down the trail. Like, oh, can we get another shot? Can we get another shot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at one moment, uh, I didn't keep an eye on the dog. He was supposed to be tied up to the bike, but he got away. 
And I turned around, they were come buzzing down the trail and they came over this blind crest. And I just heard Blake shout and I turned around and the dog was just stood there in the trail. <sighs> oh no. And Blake nearly went straight over the bars. Did he, did he take it in good faith? Was he fuming? He, I, he was I've, fuming. I've never seen Blake angry before. <laughs> I'm so angry now. Apart from on that in that moment, ah. and it, it was not good. And I felt terrible. I felt like an absolute <laughs> idiot. And ah, uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, who won the race anyway? That's quite interesting. He's got some skills, hasn't he, Blake? He has got some skills, and um, and it, it was one of those sort of GCN kind of mock-ups where the, there wasn't really a winner. It, but uh, yeah. it's. But I mean, to see him doing tabletops like over big jumps and like just yeah. uh, unbelievable. And how did Hank do? Uh, was he holding up for the roadies? Was he doing yeah. a good job or was he useless? I've I've ridden uh, quite a bit of mountain bikes with Hank and he is scarily proficient on a mountain bike. I tell you what, he's always been very brave. Yeah. Very brave. Um, he, he was always the person I never wanted to go into the last corner like side by side with. Because, oh, right. Yeah. You know, he's, he's just like, like some sort of like weird warrior instinct and he just wouldn't ever give an inch. So you yeah. raced against him? Yeah, quite a lot. You know, when um, there was this big sort of like town centre racing scene, that's kind of like really struggling a bit right now. But, you know, between the, the years of like 2010 and sort of 2019, mm. you know, we'd go to town centres, um, city centres, anywhere from like London to Stoke, up and down the UK. And, you know, we'd, we'd race flat out for an hour round and round in circles sometimes would even take right unders <laughs> and um it, it was great it was great for the cycling crowd you know that knew the riders knew what the racing format was and it was great for like non-cyclists as well it just so happened to be in stoke or birmingham or wherever we were and they'd turn up you could have a drink get some food and it was more of um like a wholesome festival rather than just a cycling event and mm. it really kind of helped draw in non-cycling types too and um the racing was absolute carnage. Sometimes. I can imagine. Massive crashes on the first corner, massive crash on the last corner. Um, yeah, we all raced unbelievably hard for um, a 50 quid note. <laughs> it was just yeah. nuts. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm going to go back to my... The reason that I asked the question, cat people versus dog people, is I actually Googled it last night because I was intrigued yeah. to see what Google might say. Mm. Cat lovers are generally more sensitive and intuitive, and but maybe more likely to prioritize their own needs and well-being over the needs of others. Selfish. Mm. On the other <laughs> hand, dog lovers tend to be more extroverted and outgoing. Yeah. So yeah. I guess my question is to you, like you've experienced a huge amount of success in your life. You've performed at the very highest level would you consider yourself selfish or would you prioritize yourself over others in certain situations or is it is there a balance there um i think you've got to be self selfish is a hard word but yeah it's self-centered and you've got to think about your your own little bubble and I think as a any professional athlete, you have to look after yourself, and you've got to sacrifice a lot, right? You've mm. got to sacrifice friends, family, birthdays, funerals, Christmas parties, birthdays, um, to look after your own agenda. Mm. You know that means traveling to the next race. That means you know eating well, sleeping well, give it the big marginal gains, and you kind of you cut out a lot of normal selfless stuff in your own weird pursuit of that you know racing around a, a big wooden track dead fast <clears> in a circle and um yeah i, I like to think that you know I, I occasionally think about others other than myself uh, particularly more so in my old age and retirement i like uh, some of the current roles i've got that are a little bit more wholesome and uh, they're not just about you know trying to be a psychopathic killer and get into that gold medal before anybody else. But yeah, I think behind a lot of sports people and successful people in general, there's, you've got to have a shred of self-importance. What the one thing that's interesting is that the, I think the thing that you're best known for is the team pursuits. Yeah. And yeah. that, that is a very much a team game. And maybe in that instance, there's, you have to give things up for your teammates. Yeah, I tell you what, like, um, at the risk of contradicting what I've just said, I'd always, 
always loved the team pursuit. I always loved road racing, which was very much like a, a team sport. Um, but funnily enough, only one person stands on the podium at the end. But there's some around, like the, the teamwork and camaraderie in sport, team sport, mm. that I just, there was a buzz off that, that I never got in anything else I did before or I've done since. And uh, a lot of people listening will be able to relate to that. But yeah, I do things for my teammates that I wouldn't do for myself. You know, I, when, being a sports person's hard work and, you know, <laughs> going out on your bike for six hours in the horrible rain and sleet and snow, it's it's a tough gig. And I struggled motivating myself a lot of the time, but I, I do it for my pals. I do it for the, the team on training camps and so on. And this is obviously a, a e-bike focused podcast and I, many listeners or viewers might not understand the team pursuit is there a way that you can describe it uh, simply for the people that maybe don't know this the sport i'll give it a go ben yeah so basically we've got four fully grown blokes uh dressed in lycra and a big pointy space helmet <laughs> for aerodynamics uh we'll ride around on carbon fiber bikes with disc wheels and um basically it's a st- standing start we'll do 16 laps which is four kilometers takes just under four minutes It's quite multi-dimensional. It's not just about four blokes taking the brain out and going really, really fast for four minutes. And it's not like a, a relay in athletics where it's kind of like four individuals doing their own stint. <clears throat> you've, you've very much got to the, we'll talk about multi-dimensional. You've got to be strong. You've got to be technically proficient. Not like a downhill mountain biker, but you've got to be able to ride your bike two or three inches away from the guy in front at 40 odd mile an hour whilst being relaxed, whilst holding an aerodynamic position, whilst being smooth, whilst nailing your turns and your changes. There's a big uh, tactical side to it as well. It's a little bit like playing a game of chess with the other team on the other side of the track. You're trying to like follow your own schedule, you know, which has been predetermined by all these thousands of training efforts you've done. But you're also trying to go a little bit faster than comfortable to try and force the hand of the other team yeah. to try and break them early or try and break <clears> them later, try and put them under pressure. Uh, but without taking an eye off your own game, you've mm. got to think about where, you, where you, t- where you change on the track. Are you slowing down? Are you speeding up? We, we make changes in pace in half a 10th of a second per lap. Yeah. It's all about making cool, calm, calculated decisions whilst you're in front of an audience of you know, 10 million people watching on TV and, you know, this once in a lifetime experience like we had in London 2012 to kind of like, you know, change, you know, potentially change your life forever. Yeah. And um, you know, performing under pressure was a massive part of it. Was that first Olympic gold the the high point or was was it London 2012 or was there another moment in your career that was the, the big standout? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, they kind of got better as it went along. Um, in 2000 and 2008, Beijing was my first gold medal. And I, I kind of walked into a, a very successful organization that at the time had a an abundance of cash and resources and people and this whole marginal gains thing. Like, you know, we found, and I really bought into this at quite a young age, we found a lot in the skin suits and um, the bikes and the technical development. Uh, we had a real, like, willingness to learn and, we had you know, Sir David Brailsford kind of like guiding the ship and we were just so far ahead of all the other nations in terms of our training and sleep hygiene and nutrition and yeah, all, all the technical side of it's, you know, quite well known. And, you know, we went to Beijing, we won by a mile and, you know, as far as winning an Olympic gold medal goes, it was, you know, I won't say a walk in the park, but it was, it was almost like a case of like, let's try not to, cock this up yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and London was kind of like it was, a, it, was st- it was a step up in terms of difficulty we hadn't beaten the Australian team for you know best part of three and a half years when we lined up there for that race I tell you what the man the amount of stress and pressure and expectation on your shoulders um, I, you know I was already the most senior fella in that team at 27 years old and I kind of felt that like the the lads were looking at me to kind of lean the team. Uh, the, even the coaches and the sports scientists were kind of looking at me for answers. And of course, you know, 
I always felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I was just winging it. Mm. And then, you know, you, you step up there for this big day that's been talked about since the dawn of time. And you're either going to have the best day of your life or you're going to have the worst day of your life. And it's all kind of decided in three and a half, four minutes. Yeah. And that, that was a lot of weight on my shoulders at that point in time. But it, when we got the job done, it felt great. But, but yeah, even better than that was kind of, I had a really shit time. Uh, for one reason or another, between 2012 and 2016. And, um, you know, for anyone that's ever lucky enough to kind of achieve their dreams, there's this idea that, um, and this is really well documented in Lottery Winners, that achievements are like possessions yeah. and that their appeal doesn't last that long. So <laughs> you don't wake up um, a year after winning the Olympics being dead happy because you're Olympic champion. You know, you're constantly looking over your shoulder, constantly worried about you're not the person you used to be, uh, constantly worried about um, you know, trying to maintain that success for your teammates and the coaches and the sports scientists and all the funding that you bring bringing to British Cycling and so on. And um, anyway, after a back operation and living in this house pretty much on my own, my orange cap, and you know, just crawling from the bed to a turbo trainer after this back operation for nine months, you know, we won that race in Rio by a tenth and a half of a second after four years of, I don't know, just um, undoing myself mentally, really. Struggling, struggling to come to terms with success, uh, struggling to come to terms with the fact that I was probably never going to be the same athlete I was after that operation. And um, yeah, that, that was a special moment. So Rio, yeah, that was a long answer to a short question, yeah. but... The, the gold medals got more difficult, but more satisfying as we went on. Yeah. It's, um, I don't think many people can really understand what it's like to, to reach that level of achievement and maybe come to the point in your mind that this could be the high point yeah, in my yeah. life. Yeah. And did, did you feel that? And did you think, oh, is it downhill from now or have I just peaked? Um, yeah, I, I tell you what, I mean, there's a lot said, isn't there, about retired footballers, retired Olympians, retired sports people in general. And, um, you know, I, now and again, you'll see ones that just continue to be an outrageous success, whatever walk of life is, business, commentary, um, coaches. The David Beckhams of the world. Yeah, the David Beckhams <clears throat> of the world. But there's also... Um, I'm literally not going to name any names, but there's other footballers we know of that haven't have done the opposite of a Beckham, let's say, and just really struggled with addiction, yeah. uh, sort of self-loathing. That idea that you're never going to be praised and you're not ever going to be as good at whatever you do for the next 30, 40, 50 years mm. as you did when you're in your 20s. And it's, it's very much a first world problem. It's very much um, an existential crisis, but that's also part of the problem, like, no one's going to shed a tear for that and they shouldn't. But, um, yeah, I mean, to, to a lesser extent, people like me have to deal with that. Well, um, you've, it feels like you found a new focus, which we'll move on to a bit later on. Um, but it, it does, it's nice to see that you've been able to channel your focus into something completely new. Yeah. I'm trying. I think, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, build, what yeah. I mean is building uh, remote control cars. <laughs> I tell you what, yeah, I did enjoy that, Ben. Um, <laughs> so this will make no sense for the listeners, but I, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I was just, I've been busy, like really busy with like multiple jobs that we'll get into. But um, yeah, I, I decided just to have a bit of me time for like four days. So I'll give it the big out of hours um, yeah. for you know, four days. Bought this Tamiya remote control kit car that some of the listeners might remember. And uh, yeah, sat here at this kitchen table and assembled the thing. No phones, no laptops. Uh, I tell you what, it was one of the best things I've done in ages. <laughs> so I really enjoyed that. And since then, I've gone down a big wormhole of watching this fella on YouTube build remote control cars. But um, <laughs> maybe I've missed my forte. Well, we were just looking for a clip of, of you uh, on YouTube. And uh, all there was was just uh, a history of remote control car building <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Um, but I mean, yeah, seriously, like to, to find a focus after the achievement in sport, it, it must be quite a difficult thing to do. And it, it does seem like it, maybe it's taking you a little bit of time to actually find, find that. I am still getting there, Ben. Like, I think, um, 
I think from the outside, like people often come up to me and they say, oh, hey, you know, you're doing really well. Are you still working with British Cycling? You're doing this, that, and the other active travel job. Um, you still sort of keep my face out there and doing public speaking and that. And I think externally, it probably looks like I'm doing a reasonable job. And um, I suppose they am, but I mean, you're still second guessing yourself every day. You're still walking into these different roles and different jobs, um, sort of battling with imposter syndrome, yeah. thinking like, Bloody, why am I st- stood here in my chinos, like talking about this? Um, you know, and that's riding around a big wooden track in Lycra is what I used to do a couple of years back. But um, yeah, I'm slowly getting there. And um, I think you've just got to be patient with yourself. If I could give other retiring athletes or, yeah, it's not it's not just an athlete thing. Like people from the military, you know, that like, you know, finish when they're 20 eight, 35, whatever, mm. and just go into a completely different role in life. You just got to be, go easy on yourself. Just because you were a somebody in that bubble yesterday doesn't mean you've got to be a somebody, a big player in another bubble tomorrow. Yeah. You know, th- there's evidence and research out there that generally says it, ex-military people take about five years. Is that right? Five years of trial and error, trying different jobs, uh, different roles, until they know what they want to do, yeah. let alone become successful in that new role. And um, it's like that for me. We're two years in, almost to the day since I retired. And I've definitely crossed out a couple of things I'm, that are not for me. And I'm slowly getting my head around things that I think like, yeah, I could do that for the next 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, so we're getting there. But um, I think we all put too much, well, not not necessarily everybody but many of us put too much pressure on ourselves to find purpose yeah yeah and i, d- I don't know we live in a funny world these days don't we where <clears throat> we'll um <laughs> how can i put it right it's almost like we're, we're, we're given this image of success right yeah the american dream uh, big house genetically impossible wife uh, fast car whatever it is like but the world is literally set up quite literally set up that that cannot be available to everyone. There's just not enough money and resource to go around, right? But what do we do? We'll put that person, that thing on a pedestal and we'll praise that as if that's like where we all should be aiming. It's it's mental. Like we know that it's it's literally not available to 99% of us, no matter how hard we try. Mm. So um, change is also quite a scary thing. Like many people, they they find themselves in a situation that they're so comfortable with for such a long time, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're just their situation changes. And I think many people are afraid of that. And if they find themselves in that situation, it it can be such a daunting place to be. um, To suddenly, in from my personal experience, to suddenly lose purpose. Yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a horrible place to be sort of psychologically. It is, yeah. And there's a reason for that. It's this um I can I'd spent like fifteen years working with this fellow called Professor Steve Peters, who was a psychiatrist, right? And um, you know, even more than like Sir Dave Brailsford, I really think that or perhaps just as much as Sir Dave, like he had a massive like, profound impact on the Great Britain cycling team and bigger than that, you know, this guy went on to um work with Ronnie O'Sullivan. Liverpool Football Club, England Football Club, and you know, I think it's fair to say that pretty much everything he touched turned to gold in one way or another. And um, yeah, he told me that like people are adverse to change. It's it's like a part of your survival instinct. You yeah. Know? Whatever. A few thousand years back, when um, hunter gatherers, and we were hunter gatherers, and we we're running around fighting tigers and all that. Like there's this part of our brain that knew that if we didn't change anything chances are we're going to live tomorrow because we live today. And even if we're in a different, difficult circumstance we weren't happy with, it's survival. We're surviving, right? Yep. So if you're a hunter-gatherer and you, you move teams, you move out of your uh, troop, move out of your territory into new territory, into a new troop, you don't know if that's certain death or not. Mm-hmm. So we have this inbuilt reluctance to change things Yeah. because if we know we don't change things, we're going to live. So it, it plays no role in common sense or logic or fact or truth because, I mean, there'll be people listening in that aren't particularly happy with relationships, the career they're in, and they'll probably know logically that if only I could just 
step back, you know, retrain for that in six months and in six years' time, I know I'd be happier with that relationship or with that job. Change. Yeah. People are adverse to change. Yeah. And was, you know, as an athlete, back to the point, you've got to change whether you like it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, broader question, which maybe is might be hard for you to answer in a concise way, oh, but yeah. why bikes? What brought you to bikes? <laughs> I tell you, that's a good question. I tell you, I went back to my youth, you know, when I was like four or five years old, I just rode bikes for fun, freedom, independence, almost like um, unwittingly involved in like active travel. It was just a way of getting out of the house, escaping, having fun with my pals. It was about one thing, it was fun. I didn't set out to be anyone or do anything, just fun. A lot of cyclists, like road and track types like me, they your dad was a cyclist and your dad's dad's dad, and it's like something that's sort of like passed down. Yeah. Um, but for me, it wasn't like that. I was just from a working class family in Barnsley, and um, yeah, I had like an estranged father. Just grew up with my mum, uh, lived with my grandparents for a lot of the time, and I just liked bikes. It was just fun. It was mm. my way of having fun on my own. It was my way of having fun with my pals. That's all it was. And then to keep answering this why, you know, a few years later when I was sort of 14, 15, 16, uh, my stepdad, Kevin Clancy, who's got where I got my name from, came into my life. And um, he wasn't a cyclist either. But what he did have was he was an ambitious fella. And, you know, even today he's a good role model for me. And every time I cock things up, I'm on the phone to him to like, you know, for a bit of life advice. And um, I think as a young man or teenager, rather, I kind of like married this love of riding bikes with ambition that I saw with him. Yeah. And I was like, hey, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool if I could somehow make a living out of doing what I love and like marry up that ambition to the love of riding bikes? And off I went and we started doing some racing. He took me some club races and not just over that hill behind us there, there was uh, the club 10 course with the home valley wheelers and yeah before long british sighting picked me up through their talent pathways and mm. you know a lot of the time with these things it's just a case of being in the right place at the right time i worked hard i was given opportunity i had some good mentors around me at the time and uh yeah as soon as i got my foot in the door i never looked back yeah and um i didn't want to do anything else at that point in time you know in my late teens early 20s it was hard work. It was hard work not going out on the piss with your friends. It was hard work um, being broke, living like you're broke. And, um, you know, even when I started making money out of the sport, you never know when it's going to end. And I continued to live like <clears throat> I was completely broke, you know, until I was sort of like yeah. in my late 20s. And all I did was work, live a very like... Um, a simple life outside of cycling. Yeah. It was just eat, sleep, ride. And I had to do that. I wasn't Bradley Wiggins, I wasn't Geraint Thomas, but to ride with these guys and win Olympic gold medals with them, I was all in. And um, yeah, that's what it looked like for me. Is it hard to make a, a good career from cycling? Yeah, I, t I tell you what, I'll answer that in like two ways. So yeah, First of all, yeah, in terms of like uh, being a professional road or track cyclist, today it's a lot harder now to be a professional cyclist than it was 10 years ago. So, for example, um, I know you work with some of the GCN lads, um, some of them which I used to ride and race bikes with, you know, up and down the country in these town centre races. You know, seven, eight years ago, you could make, uh, you know, a, more than a good living off doing that and you'd perhaps have to race... 40 or 50 days a year mm. and, and obviously you have to train for the other 300 of them <laughs> but it, it, it could be a nice way to make a, a good living doing something you love yeah these days that scene the the uk domestic scene has gone the the racing scene is um is really struggling uh, local councils don't have an abundance of cash you know bike brands bike partners bike sponsors and so on they're struggling as we all know and um, yeah, there's just not the money in the scene to make a living off it. Um, but to answer that question in a more general sense, is it hard to 
make a living off of being a bike rider. Yeah, it's bloody hard. You know, I mean, you've got to make a lot of sacrifice. But, like, you know, retiring's also given me appreciation that it's, it's bloody hard to make a living doing other stuff as well. Yeah. The um, yeah, So your career kind of came to an end in, in competition due to injury. Yeah, yeah. And that was in 2021 you eventually retired? Yeah, so, um, yeah, 2015 I had that back operation. And, um, yeah, I was never the same after that. I somehow, somehow scrabbled that last gold medal in Rio nine months later after a, just an epic period of isolation and indoor training. And then it was five years later, thanks to coronavirus, was Tokyo. And... Um, it always denied at the time, but I was always kind of like, I was never the same, honestly. I was, my training was always limited by my back. It, you know, once you've had an operation in your lower back, there's quite a concentrated amount of muscle around there. And if you look at the positions we ride in in the team pursuit, you need a fair bit of lower back strength. I just felt like I never had the same pedaling coordination. And um, it was always a limiting factor. I, I made the team... On merit, we went to Tokyo, and yeah, no, I, everything in training, to be fair, in the weeks preceding it, would have suggested that we were looking pretty good. You know, we were breaking national records in training, and yeah, no, I was very much open to come away from the last Olympics with another medal at least. Um, the world had moved on, like, you know, the Aussies, the Danish, the Italians. We knew we had some tough competition, but we also knew we were going to be like right at the sharp end. Truth told, though, um, you know, for the first time in my Olympic experience, like, I was the weak link in the team. Really? And um, yeah, it's, it's hard to believe, but for, <laughs> for a decent period of time, I, I was good at my job. And I was usually the one that was kind of like looking at the graphs and the debriefs afterwards, being like, yeah, yeah, like, it's all good. Sigh of relief. I deserve to be in this team. Like we're pulling my weight here, but not in Tokyo. I was crap. And um, at that point in time, you've got to make a brave decision. You know, you either sort of like dig your heels in and say, oh, you know what, I'm coming back tomorrow to kind of like be in the team and try to hopefully fight for medals again. Or you sort of say, I ain't got it, lads. Let's see if we can like rework this team, change the order, change the lineup. And uh, try something new, which, you know, for me meant that I had to like, unceremoniously just like bow, bow out halfway through the Olympics. Um, Apologised to my teammates, to the coaches, to the sports scientists, to the Great Britain cycling team that sort of believed in me and put me there and spent four or five years trying to invest in me and the whole team. And yeah, it didn't didn't work out well at all, really. And, you know, the, the fifth guy that we put in, um, not through his own fault, just... Um, through my fault, really, you know, I, I was showing signs that we were going to bring something useful to the party. Hence why I was there in the lineup for four. On the big day, I just, you're a human thing, right? You know, you're a biological thing. You have good days, you have bad days, uh, good weeks, bad weeks. I just had a bad week, bad back. I wasn't sleeping great. And, um, yeah, no, it was that sort of Olympic failure in Tokyo was very much down to me. And uh, that was a nice way to win my career. But that, that's that sport. And um, I'd much rather we won. But in hindsight, I think it's never a bad thing, you know, to, to have some lows in life in general, not just in sport. I think it gives people um, certain, like, sensitivity or appreciation for just like life in general the most interesting i meet a lot of people these days you know business types uh, council types sporting types like just all sorts of people from all sorts of different walks of life and the most interesting people i meet are the ones that have known struggle they've known defeat they've known adversity loss and um i honestly think it makes people more interesting yeah. if nothing else and uh yeah i'm, I'm kind of glad in hindsight that i've got a story of failure to kind of like go along with the the gold medals and glitz and glamour. Yeah. And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I really believe that. Mm. I really believe that. Like, you know, people often ask me, like, how do you build resilience? Yeah. And the best answer I've got for that is by fucking things up. Yeah. By not getting it right. 
by putting yourself forward, by rejection, by failure, by not making the team, by not winning. Like, I really, it's like training, right? You go in the gym and you don't come out of the gym stronger, you come out of the gym weaker, right? So you kind of like, you drop down on the graph. But if you give yourself two or three days, you are indeed stronger. I think mental health and resilience works in exactly the same way. Some of the hardest, most resilient, strongest people I know mentally are the ones that have been through the most shit. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. You take a knock and assume it doesn't completely break you, very much like training. You know, you'll take a hit from the gym. You'll take a hit from life. It takes, it knocks you back. Then you'll be down for a week, maybe two weeks, maybe two months. But people come back and they super compensate mentally. And um, yeah, for what it's worth, when you reframe it like that, um, I think it'll do me some good. Let's move on to your new role that you've got. Um, could you explain the job that you're doing now? Yeah, so I've got a few different roles that I basically con contract to in the sort of retired life. I still work with British Cycling. I uh, work on the, the research and innovation team, so developing skin suits, bikes. Uh, there's a bit of crossover work with the commercial team, so I do a little bit of work with the commercial team at British Cycling too. It, that place is always going to have a special place in my heart, so it's nice to stay connected with them. I'm a brand ambassador and do some business development work with a company called CAMS, Cycle Accident Management Services. Again, it's nice to work with, um, you know, an organization that has a bit of a place in my heart too. You know, every, everyone um, who rides a bike will know someone that's been hit by a car over the years and I'm the same. So to work with a, a company that looks after the vulnerable road user, helps people get back on the road, um, is, is a good company to work for. Uh, third job, active travel commissioner for South Yorkshire. So maybe you forgot that one. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> I said, how can I? It's been taking a lot of my time recently. <laughs> so uh, yeah, basically, I get to work with the mayor of South Yorkshire, and it's my job to help promote uh, walking, cycling, scooting, skating, uh, both infrastructure, like you know, trying to get new bike lanes in uh, where they're needed, where they're appropriate, and trying to change like hearts and minds and behaviours. Mm. Does that make sense? Right, a lot of things like uh, more tolerant car drivers, um, trying to. In encourage schools to have bikeability lessons and things like that. Um, they have this thing called school streets, you know, where they stop cars parking outside so kids do a bit of walking. There's loads of research. This isn't rocket science. Um, you know, if kids are engaged in cycling or walking, any sort of activity from an early age uh, in school, they'll tend to do it outside of school. They'll tend to carry it on into their adult life. And... Um, yeah, I don't know I've rode a bike for a living for a long time, but I tell you what, the, the cycling is one of the best things in my life, yeah. you know, even just as a leisure tool or a commuting tool. And um, yeah, I, I want everyone to enjoy a bit of that. So I'm, it's another job I'm passionate about. I do a bit of public speaking. I work for a performance consultancy business called Pro Noctis. So I, I, I do all sorts of stuff. And I guess I'm in like a very um, exploratory phase of my life right now. I'm trying to find out what I enjoy and... Maybe this is already the answer. Yeah. Maybe the answer is doing multiple jobs and, um, you know, trying to like maximize your time and value across multiple organizations. Mm. We'll work it out eventually, Ben. Well, sure. I, I, I like to see life as a series of chapters. And I, I think that for you, you've obviously specialized in one thing and becoming, you were incredibly obsessed with one goal. Yeah. And now to spread yourself across sort of multiple uh, different areas, I think it can be quite healthy perhaps to, mm. I don't, it, it, you're almost testing your brain in a different way, aren't you? hundred percent. Like, honestly, I, I didn't realize that you could get like fatigued from thinking. <laughs> I, just, I, I don't know if that sounds like oh, onto yeah. a lot of people listening, well, but like fatigue for me was just like, you'd ride a bike, you'd feel knackered, you'd sleep, you'd eat, you know, eventually you'd feel all right. Yeah. I'll tell you what, there's some days where um, you might be doing a, a talk in public, you might be speaking about this, you might have a debate with people. Um, you might just be doing like 50 emails. I tell you what, there's nothing more exhausting than using your brain. Yes. And the retirement has given me a massive appreciation for how hard, you know, real world jobs can be. Yeah. Not easy, like getting up, you know, working long hours, uh, politics, um, just office politics, let alone like, you know, government type politics is bloody hard work, uh, division, stressful. And there's something, riding a bike for a living, it's not easy, but it is simple. Yeah. It's 
very simple. It's very one dimensional when you look at it. And um, yeah, there's pros and cons to that. But I think generally speaking, yeah, moving on from that world is a good thing. I think um, for me, uh, I've recently experienced quite a lot of uh, stressful, I've uh, been through a stressful time in my life in just trying to re renovate a large property. And the, the most stressful thing for me was communicating with people on a daily basis, mm. just continual asking for the things and asking people to do things for you and yeah. uh, to liaise with people. And, and I think that that is, for me, it's particularly testing. And I would come back from a day of doing, like I might not have actually lifted anything heavy that day, but I'd be mentally exhausted. Mm. So I, I, yeah, for me, people contact can yeah, often yeah. be quite exhausting. Yeah. Um, That's interesting that. And like, you know, this is, you know, this introvert and extrovert thing as well, Ben. And I don't know where you'd consider yourself on the timeline. I'm a dog person. Extrovert then, right? <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. Extrovert. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I mean, like, there's this idea that, like, you know, if people are extroverted, they, um, you know, they're good in a social situation. They love being, and, and if you're an introverted person, you can't speak in public. You can't socialize. Mm. You have no social skills. But that's not the definition. It's where you recharge your batteries, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like extroverted people, when they're knackered, we see this in bike teams, bike racing. Like those guys are called John Mould. We do a six hour ride, day after day after day after day. We're all knackered. He charged himself up, you know, he re energized by getting all the boys together and going down the cafe. No way. Yeah. And there's like there's the team introverts, you know, when they're knackered, they literally go into a dark room, curtains closed. Mm. You know, they wouldn't even bother watching Netflix. They were they just wanted like no stimulation. Yeah. And that's how you define an introvert and extrovert. Do you charge your batteries up in private? Do you charge your batteries up in front of a big team and I do think a lot of the modern world is kind of set up to suit introverts. Yes. You've sort of seen like Google and things like that. They've been quite uh, forward thinking in terms of like, they have like movable office space. So people can work in a confined area. Yeah. yeah okay. Or if they feel a bit more extroverted, they can open up these like movable walls. And, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently so. But it's, um, people are cocking onto it now, but it's, uh, especially in like business worlds and salespeople, they've, it's very hard to be a good salesperson and meet different people all the time if you're a bit of an introvert. It's very tiring. Well, I, uh, this actually touches on something which I looked into. Um, in a recent study, the UK was found to be one of the least connected countries in the world, least connected uh, person to person and also least connected to the outdoors. Um, so that, that, that says a lot about the UK, I think, and uh, it's concerning really to think that people aren't having those connections with people. And yeah. like you say, the introverted out yeah. there, it, it almost makes them even more introverted. Yeah, definitely. And so what you said there about the, the outdoors as well, we're not connected to the outdoors. It's, um, I think that's a shame. Yeah. I, t I tell you what as well, like activity. <clears throat> I mean, there's literally like thousands of independent studies have been conducted, right? That link physical health to mental health yeah you know and it's not just like mumbo jumbo there's like a, a chemical reaction there's uh, endorphins a dopamine hit serotonin and all that stuff it helps you sort of like focus better helps children focus better in schools it helps adults focus better at work helps you sleep better and um yeah for, for what it's worth I, I know like people recognize me in the sort of like the high-end performance marginal gains type but for me, what's just as important, probably more important really, is um, you know people getting the mountain bike out of the weekend, mm -hmm. going for a ride with their pals, forgetting about the day at the work and the week at work. Uh, families getting out at the weekends, you know, just going for a, a walk and explore and you know, feeling good about life, good about themselves. People commuting to work, getting a bit of exercise on the way to work, ticks, you know, two birds with one stone. And, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. It's um it, it brings us neatly onto the world of e-bikes. Yeah. Because to me, bikes, I, I could apply this to bikes, but e-bikes in particular, yeah. they give me freedom. Mm. They give me the opportunity to go out and ride. Maybe when I'm not really feeling like knackering myself, maybe after work, I've got an hour free. Yeah. I want to walk the dog. Mm. And the e-bike is the perfect tool. Effort to reward ratio. Yeah. I don't think I've found anything that quite matches an e-bike. Yeah. What's the reason that you ride e-bikes? <laughs> well, as you know, Ben, I bloody love e-bikes, which is a big part of the reason we're sat here. But um, I mean, like, let's think about like the three uses that you can have with a, a normal bike, right? 
So you can race them, you can do the Tour de France, you can do the Olympics. And I know like electric mountain bike racing is starting to take off, uh, less so on the road, but I do think there's potential there. Now, you've kind of got the other two uses of a bicycle, which is kind of like leisure and commuting. Yeah. So let's go for commuting first. So if I was going to ride my bike here from my house here in Own Firth to Manchester or Sheffield, which I do, mm. you know, with a laptop and my chinos on, it's like, well, am I realistically going to do that on my racing bike? And it's going to take an hour and 20 minutes, head to toe in Lycra. I'm going to have to get a shower when I get there. People are going to think I'm weird when I turn up to the office in my little clippy cloppy carbon fiber shoes. Or I can get on my e-bike, bosh along at exactly the same speed as I would head to toe in Lycra, just wearing my civvies. Uh, you turn up, you don't need a shower, you don't need to do anything. You just rock into the office and you go. So in terms of a commuting tool, I honestly think e-bikes are a total game changer, especially around here where you're just surrounded by home moss and that massive moor behind us. Yeah. A total game changer. We've already got an alternative to a car. And leisure it sort of brings us on electric mountain bikes. Again, they're just... Why do people go on the mountain bike at the weekend? Um course to keep fit but you can pedal them just as hard yeah 100 percent you can i mean they've literally got um on the bosch motor on that trek downstairs it's got a built-in power meter you know what you know how much power you're doing you've got to pay a thousand pound for that if you want it on your road bike yeah and um you can do three times as many downhill runs as you can for the same effort you know which is what you really want to do you want to go out you want to have fun with your, your mates and i don't know i just um so on Sunday, right, I'm going to go out with a guy that used to be a director for Asda, a guy that fixes farm machinery. Um, one guy's an engineer in Huddersfield, and we'll all ride e-mountain bikes together, right? All got completely different levels of ability and fitness. Pretty much got nothing in common apart from the fact that we all love riding our bikes at the weekend. Yet on the electric mountain bikes, like, we can all do it together. Yeah. One of us might be an eco, one of us might be in turbo, you know, one of us might be in something in the middle. Doesn't matter. We'll all have a right on the downhills. Um, we all have a good laugh on the uphills. And we all ride our bikes four times as much because we have an absolute riot. And um, yeah, you know what? Coming from my world of you know, like uh, professional road cycling and cyclists, mm. I think there is a bit of a reluctance to engage with them. But not me, mate. I, I think they're great. Yeah, I really like them. It, I've been riding e-bikes since 2016, 2017, maybe, um, mostly for work. Uh, originally, it was just to use, they were a tool to get around on. Yeah. And um, back then, we very much had this stigma of, oh, you're cheating. Riding an yeah. e-bike, you're cheating. Even when I had a bloody great rucksack on my back full of camera gear, yeah. still, like, <laughs> you still get people sort of going, yeah. oh, bloody e-bike. Do you think that stigma is starting to drift in the world of bikes? And and the, the reason I asked that is I thought it was. And I, the more time that I spend at trail centers and in places the, where you find you meet other mountain bikers, well, for one, there's a lot more people running e-bikes, but two, the mountain bikers on their regular bikes aren't really turning their nose up at you anymore. Um, yeah. On the other hand, I rode up Snowden multiple times this year for, for work. I was, I was filming a, a BBC series about the summit. And whilst riding up to, up the track, which is a, a bridleway, um, so you're, you're sharing the path with walkers, I would get people that would see me come past and they'd go, oh, cheat, cheat. Like, oh, look at him, he's on an <laughs> e-bike. And I think, like, if only you knew. Yeah, it's... Um You've still got to pedal them. That's the thing. Like, in, if you want to do uh, an effort on it, you can put the same amount of effort in. Yeah. So uh, it kind of gives you two options. You can um, you can do the same distance at the same speed for way, 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 way less effort, right? Or, which is probably the thing me and you do, right? You just go three times as fast and three times as far for the same effort. Yeah, and That's the thing. And um, obviously by doing that, it just enables you to cover so much more ground, see three times as much of the world, have three times as many downhill runs. But to answer your question, I reckon perceptions are changing slowly. Mm. 
more, I've, I don't know, some like reluctant mountain bike types that have finally cracked. And just last week, they've got themselves an electric mountain bike on order. Okay. But um, it's interesting why it's taken so long. But I, I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone get an electric mountain bike and then decide they want to go back to an analog bike. No. I've never seen it that way around. No. And um, yeah, I, it, it is different on the road, right? So when you head to tow in Lycra and you're on a, a wonderful racing bike that weighs seven and a half kilos, there's a certain sort of like joy and satisfaction about going uphill mm. because you can still shift along, right? You know, you can still yeah. go up there at 15, 16, 17 mile an hour, even on the steep stuff around here. You know, if you're a well-trained cyclist and that's all right. But on a mountain bike, even a fit rider on a quality analog mountain bike, going uphill off road is very much a walking pace affair, zigzagging, wheel spinning, you're just sweating away. You know, even the coldest of days, just getting going absolutely nowhere fast, getting to the top of the climb knackered. So when you ride down, you kind of knock yourself as well. I don't know. It's um, yeah. It's it's not a world that kind of defines itself on like peak powers and thresholds and heart rates anyway. So um, yeah. Has riding electric mountain bikes improved your technical mountain biking ability? Yeah. So you saw me in Salvatch about um, was it sixteen months ago. Yeah, you, you know I can ride a mountain bike, yeah, but you also know, yeah I can ride a bike well, <laughs> but I'm not like Steve Pete, right? So for me, it's like I think I think what gave me the confidence is I saw um, it's Neil Donahue, right? And he's the probably Don. On, yeah, yeah, the Don. He was probably on one of your videos, mate. Like, and he, he was riding downhill on um, an analog bike and an e-bike. On, um, he tried to make everything the sort of same within reason, like same frame size, same tires, and all that. Same course, same condition, same day. And the yeah, you know, the Don went down there, and I think on one run he was a second half faster on the analog bike, and then the other run he was a couple of seconds faster on the e bike, and he did a few runs at each. And I was like, well, bloody hell, if this guy can't tell the difference, yeah, this is a proper legit racer, like yeah. ex down uh, downhill World Cup legend. Like and then people sort of like <laughs> talk about like e-bikes are unrideable or like I feel the weight of the corners. The weight, yeah. oh, man. I think you know there's of course they're going to be slightly less maneuverable if you want to start hopping around like a trials rider on your back wheel. I was just about to say it might be slightly more difficult, but um, what's his name? Jack Carthy is it? Uh, he's, yeah, he lives again like a massive trials legend. I think Orange have given him an e-mountain bike. Mm. I, I watch him ride that thing like a pogo stick. Yeah, he just over massive great boulders and I tell you what if them boys don't struggle with it I don't think the rest of us have to worry people yeah. people get very hung up on the weight of e-bikes and it, it's often the barrier that stops people from committing to it but yeah, yeah. like you say when you see what people do on trials motorbikes yeah and it's like what the hell do they weigh I mean, you, you, <laughs> yeah. you've got one downstairs I have yeah I've got a, a gas gas trial bike downstairs I'm a big trials fan and um, I tell you what, I honestly think that's the second best sport in the world behind cycling. I okay. love trials. It's um, we've gone off on a tangent here, but I can't stop myself. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Like the, it's it, the, the best trials ride in the world. They've got like um, balance, like a ballerina, you know, uh, strength, like a gymnast, uh, the coordination, but sort of like bravery and, and all that stuff as well. Mm. And again, a bit like cycling, there's this sort of, like, beautiful marriage between like uh, human performance and mechanical performance. Yeah. I really like trials and um, also it's unlike most motorsports, it's not outrageously expensive to get into. You could buy yourself a van for a couple of grand and a trials bike for two grand and that'd probably be good enough to win um, like club trials, like regional level trials if you were good enough. Mm. You know, if you spent another 20 grand, you'd have everything you need to bet a 10 grand van, some spares, spend five grand on a trials bike. That's yeah. everything you need to be like a national level hitter. So that's pretty cool for me. But um, yeah, I can't even remember what your original question was. But in terms of like comparing like the analog bikes and e-bikes yeah, and the weights. Yeah. I mean, what's it, 22 kilos for a full fat 750 watt hour battery, right? Yeah. Um, but if we're comparing that to like like for like, so um, an equally leggy Enduro-y type 
analog mountain bike, they're 14, 15 kilos anyway, right? Mm. What we're talking about, 50% heavier there. But when you add a big 80 kilo lump on top of it, like me, so what we're talking about, 95 kilos versus 102 kilos. 5% difference. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> it's just... It's interesting to put it yeah. that way when you yeah. combine the rider weight as well. Exactly. And you have to remember, it's like, it's not like you've added um, seven or eight kilos to your handlebars or your saddle. Mm. You've stuck it right around your bottom bracket and the down tube, yeah. literally in the center of your bike. Yeah. The brakes on modern mountain bikes, the suspension, they're more than strong enough to handle another two or 300, or you know, five or 600 watts. Yeah. And seven or eight kilos. Um... So it's not like they have to overbuild the bikes in any other way. But yeah, yeah, you probably told us, you can tell already that I'm pretty sold on these things. And yeah, honestly, mate, I, I've got a few bikes in the garages you've seen, but yeah. eight times out of 10, mate, it's the it's the mountain bike that get used. Well, it's the fact that Farmer John down the road or whoever and an Olympic mm. world record holder, yeah. gold medalist, et cetera, yeah. can ride together yeah. and both get the same enjoyment out of the same day on a bike. Ah, um, yeah. You, you can only do that on an e-bike. Exactly. Honestly, mate, it's, I tell you what, it's perhaps an even better example, um, which isn't necessarily like e-mountain bike specific, but it's definitely e-bike specific, right? I, my girlfriend, um, I've been seeing her for five years, right? Great girl, uh, but she's not sporty. She's not athletic, right? Um, you know, she works uh, for the big life company in Manchester, like yeah. PR and media. I'm trying to paint the picture that she's just not into sports and cycling at all mm. she's from central london she never really learned how to ride a bike anyway so i had this idea with you know with all the best intention of like let's try and do something <laughs> like nice together so this is a couple of years back we I, we went out on the mountain bikes around the local reservoir around here and i was on like a specialized stunt jumper thing and she was on the the hope hb 130 nice bikes nice bit of kit but um on an analog bike you know, like there was tears and yeah. anger and everything was my fault. Everything, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. wouldn't believe it. Um, so, yeah, we never tried that again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, That was it. We never tried it again. But more recently, she's had a go on um, that. I've got like a commuter e-bike thing. Mm. She'd be begging me for one for Christmas. You won't let it go. Yeah. So it's just complete game changer in um, a massive great hill just outside my house here called home moss big tour de france hill it's a bit of a an epic climb around here i was on the gravel bike she was on the electric commuter bike you know just in a bloody jeans and flip-flops yeah can't keep up with her and that to me is what when i saw that when i saw somebody that hates bikes as much as she did you know get on that electric bike uh be you know an ex-olympian to the top of an hill and really enjoyed it and just says she wants to get a, a bike like that. So, you know, when the weather's slightly less naff, she can get out and just explore and go outside. Mm. I'm like, that for me, like, was like, yeah, bloody hell, there's, there's something behind these things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's not someone that's got the intention of winning Olympic gold <clears throat> medal or the Tour de France or anything like that. But it's less alienating. It's more inclusive. And uh, in the end, like you say, I can go ride the bike with Farmer John at the weekend and, Brings us together. Yeah. This is what it's all about, isn't it? Trying to have a good time. So you ride a Trek rail. Is there a reason that you chose the Trek rail? Um, you're, you've got a pal called Rob. <laughs> no, I know Rob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually saw um, Rob rides. He did a, a bit of a, re a review on the Trek rail. Probably going back a couple of years ago now. Mm. And um, uh, he's, he's obviously done a, a lot for promoting electric mountain bikes. And he obviously knows his stuff. And I remember watching him do a review of the Trek rail and, didn't really have anything bad to say about it yeah he's probably being paid yeah <laughs> no, I, no that wouldn't, that's not true that wouldn't be the case no no but i tell you what but even if he is like uh, and i hope he is like the, he sort of he gave it a good rundown i know the bosch motor is a, a good thing i've always been a bit of a shimano fan mm. it ticked a couple of those boxes um through one of my contacts at cams one of the business development managers had a good relationship with um the leisure lakes bikes down there so um we've got our heads together and um yeah, I got myself a little Trek rail. Yeah. And it, honestly, it's been bloody grand. Uh, it's been absolutely faultless. I actually rode a Trek rail in Verbier last year um, at the Bosch uh, e-bike festival. And I was so impressed by the Trek. Um, really, really 
good bit of kit and definitely a bike that I would recommend. I did actually recommend it to a friend shortly after and he went and bought one, yeah. which uh, I, it always scares me when I recommend a bike to somebody and then you just go and buy it. And then yeah, I think, yeah. oh no, what happens when it packs <laughs> up? No stress, yeah. 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 I think it's interesting like the, the full fat thing versus like the SL e-bikes. Mm. I've spent a bit of time on an SL one, but um, yeah. for me, it's not so much like the, because that, that thing makes so much power. It's almost like... I very rarely run it in turbo mode, yeah. but I do like the the big battery. So I almost what I'm saying is, I'd, if we could have like a big battery, but like a smaller, more compact motor, nobody nobody does that right now. No. There's, there's not really a big need for that. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to see. I'm I'm keen to see what the future holds, and you know they're moving on so fast, right? Every couple of years, and not just Bosch, but Shimano, um, SRAM getting involved. Yeah. I don't know if that's with the well, same sort of like specialized bros unit is yes it? yeah yeah it's um but either way they're all constantly moving on so if they're getting smaller getting more powerful more torque and more efficient uh same with the batteries you know for the same capacity they're getting lighter and lighter and yeah yeah i honestly think in five years time mate we'll be sat here and um the sl bikes will have the same amount of power as they do today yeah i mean they're, they're not far off like my, my friend rides a full powered like full fat uh vitus bike but it's one from several years ago so the the motor's only 65 newton meters i think uh, yeah, yeah. and the new bosch uh, uh SX, sx motor yeah. that's 55 newton meters so yeah. we're getting pretty close to what the 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 bikes of three or four years ago full power ones yeah, were, yeah. and they're now the lightweight ones so yeah. it's, we're not far off we're getting there aren't we and um I just again like additional benefits of e-bikes you know just having like slightly shorter cranks and things like that yeah i just I see, like coming from a road sort of background you're not that used to getting like pedal strikes here there and everywhere mm. but you kind of do on mountain bikes don't you, you do and um yeah i mean we'll be interested to see what happens with crank lengths but i think i'm on 165s but i've got a pal that's on 155s yeah. and don't seem to bother him i mean we've done a lot of like biomechanical testing actually in british cycling over the years and until you start going really, really long or really, really short on cranks, and I'm talking like big extremes, there is there's no difference in efficiency in terms of like your your breathing, um, you know your VO2 max and things like that, and your crank length. Mm. You know if you have shorter cranks, you'll run a higher cadence. Uh, you, you produce less torque, right? Because you've got shorter levers. But yeah. in terms of the power and your sort of mechanical efficiency, don't really change anything. I think it's a safer way to ride as well because pedal strikes are not only an issue on the way up, but also like big time on the way down. I and I, and a, probably some of the biggest crashes I ever had back in the day were because of pedal strikes. Yeah. And it's, if it's less likely to happen on a shorter crank length, then I'd take that all day long. Yeah. It just makes sense to as well. Just to have your feet a little bit less staggered. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, true. It's not like I spend like hours in the air, like uh, you and your pals do, but you know, when your clanks less staggered, you're a bit more like a motocross stance rather than like, um, mm makes a bit more sense doesn't it yeah um yeah. it's uh yeah it's it's one of those things where there's there's lots of minute changes i think we could make in the bike industry and mm. they are happening they're they're starting to see a lot more kind of little adjustments and fine tuning like flip chips in the frames yeah, and yeah, yeah. uh obviously there's the, the wheel size debate yeah, as well yeah there is yeah what's your take on that then rob uh i i like a mullet ben bike. i call you Lee, rob, rob right. then yeah ben roberts yeah um it's uh i like a, a mullet bike um yeah, yeah. so i i'll take a i'll take the the rollover of a 29 inch front wheel i yeah. find you know you can clear things a bit easier it doesn't bog down as much but to have um to not have a wheel buzzing up your ass with, with a 29er uh if you've got a slightly smaller wheel you can when you're riding steep stuff i think i prefer that a little bit yeah, um yeah, yeah. also it probably corners a bit quicker with a, a mullet bike so i yeah, this yeah. the style of riding i like to do is often quite steep off piste sort of trails oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah how about you i'll tell you what you'd like it around grenoside and warncliffe mate there's a few like real well by my standards like steep stuff over there in um warncliffe in particular you know steve peak county mm. where, um, but um, yeah I've, there's the trek rails running uh, it's 29 a front and back I've spent a bit of time on mullet bikes. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is like the traditional roadie side coming out with me, but um, I think perhaps because I'm, I'm probably similar height, aren't we? I'm 185 centimeters tall, <clears> six foot one. I'm six foot. Yeah. I, I occasionally like 
get a back wheel on my ass, but not that often. And I do, when you watch a really good rider, I went, I tell you what, I went down like a double black run with, uh, what's it called? Painer. Um, mm. Yeah. In, uh, in Salback. And when I was watching him, like really, uh, going for it, he sort of like hops and skimps over like, just like horrible, rough technical things. He'll like just bunny up like the, the things just bounces and bounces, but not me. I just like snow plow through stuff. Do you know what I mean? You just kind of lean back and just like plow through things. And I think <laughs> a bigger wheel on the back just lets you get away with a bit more. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You haven't yeah. quite got the skill to sort of like hop and bounce between things and you know, whether it corners slightly quicker or not. Yeah. Is somewhat nothing to someone like me, but um, yeah, I'm quite happy 29 in front and back. But when you think, look at the trials bikes, for example, motorbikes, they've always got like a bigger front wheel, smaller back. Oh, sure, yeah. In terms of like, you know, um, I've crashed a fair few bikes in my time and it's always the back wheel that seems to be end up buckled before the front one. Yeah. So it's smaller and stiffer and more yeah. compact. So I like that about having a mullet set up. I agree. So I'm a bit conflicted, as you can tell. You mentioned Salback. Uh, it's pretty cool out there, isn't it? Riding out oh, is amazing. Yeah. I tell you what, that was the first time I've been abroad on a mountain bike. Is period. it? Yeah. I've wow. been, you know, I've just been a ra- racing abroad, road races, track races. You spend half your life on uh, camps and things. But yeah, it was literally like, a, we, were th- we were there working, weren't we, in theory? <laughs> we were there working, Ben, but like... Um, Grinding. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what, it was a grind. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we just right. we got a ski lift up. We rode our bikes down the side of a massive hill for four days. And um, yeah, I did, but honestly, the best time. It was mm. absolutely mint. Yeah. I'm really keen to get back out there. And um, yeah, honestly, in my, in my old age, mate, I'm thinking about getting a little pad out there in Europe somewhere. Yeah. And I don't want it to be too far away from a ski lift and a massive hill. Yeah. It was just such a laugh. You need, said, how, how do you travel with an e-bike though? That's something I've yeah. been thinking about. It's a challenge. and it's, You can't fly with them, right? No, you can only, the, the battery size is limited. So you can travel with a battery in your hand luggage, but it's only, yeah, it's bloody small what you're actually allowed to travel with. So, so you can't take your 750 watt hour in. <laughs> you can't, no, no. But scan that through. Uh, I, I don't know, yeah. What's the size? It's, it's not like e-bike size and you can't. It might be 250 watts, I think could yeah. be the upper end. Uh, I'm not. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure, but it's yeah. I, you might some lightweight bikes you might just uh, be able to get the battery through on, but yeah. it's a, it's an issue. Um, and I think there's definitely a business there for yeah, yeah. It, in some places for just doing battery rental. Mm. Um, so you yeah. can just take the bike over without the battery and then rent a battery for the week. Yeah, or, or EasyJet if you're listening, just let us take our bikes on. That would be, be that would be much better. Yeah, would not it? There must be I have like a safe place you can take your battery out and dump it in a um, fireproof box. Yeah. Yeah, you'd think. I mean, I, again, what do I know about aviation safety? Well, I, I travel with a lot of drone batteries <laughs> and scanning through, but especially if you go on a big trip and you bring in just like enough, make sure yeah. you've got enough batteries. And when you're putting that through, you think, oh God. Yeah. I tell uh, you what, Ben, we must have enough batteries here to power a small village or all this set up. <laughs> well, the, the, this one keeps being an issue. It keeps like to turn itself off. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh yeah I uh it's talking of the Alps um the Port de Soleil region in um in France so yeah. Mors in Leger um Châtel those are th- that that's an incredible place to ride a bike and if oh, yeah. you get the opportunity to ride a mountain bike in the Alps I recommend going there because there's so much on offer in such a small space yeah. and the lift pass is also really reasonable so you I, I'm not entirely sure the reason but I think it's because they're trying to attract more mountain bikers to the region yeah, but okay. it's like in terms of value for money and this the vast terrain that you can ride it's that I don't think you can really beat it in Europe I think yeah, it's probably yeah, the best okay. but but Austria was still good I was still very impressed by Austria and the the chairlifts there as well the gondolas are incredible they're just everything is so plush and so new yeah is that right i mean i get nothing to compare it to because i've never been in one before and i've yeah. never been a ski lift like that yeah. never been skiing but honestly it was uh anyone listening listening that's um not been out there yeah, get yourself out there honestly Definitely. it was amazing and i don't know the alps and the pyrenees it's um I've been all over the world, like, you know, different continents, different bike races and things like that. But there's something about the Alps and the Pyrenees. It's just mint. Yeah. It's for anyone that feels like they've had their head in a laptop screen for too long, get yourself out there. Yeah. The e-bike, analog bike, whatever it is, road bike. 
<laughs> are we allowed to say that on this pod? But um, <laughs> no, it, it's a nice place. And um, yeah, that was great that week just to disconnect. And We spoke about cycling infrastructure earlier. Oh, and yeah. it, in the UK, it always frustrates me that when you compare it, when you do go abroad mm. and you see what's been done abroad, I mean, whether it's cycling infrastructure or just uh, the facilities and the outdoors, if, even if it's parks for children, yeah. It's the, the UK, in my opinion, is pretty woeful, especially as you move further north and maybe where money doesn't get spent as much on public infrastructure. I personally feel like people who work in government should spend a bit of time in the Alps, in Mallorca, in yeah. sort of places where bikes are, they're not seen as a hindrance seen as a, an asset to people's lives. Well, hey, welcome to my world for a start. I mean, I, I'm a really passionate believer in um, getting people more active, particularly just if they can integrate a degree of activity on the way to work, it's the easiest way to do it. And, um, you, you know, this is not rocket science. This is not new information. This is well known. We have to have better infrastructure to enable people to do that, you know, to give them the capability and the opportunity you know, there's no point in trying to motivate people to go ride the bike yeah. if they don't feel like they're able to. And uh, people like me and you would be fairly confident bike riders, right? You know, truth be told, we you know we're both probably quite happy to get on a bike and bang down the main road. It's not going to stop us, but for a lot of people, 100%, that's the biggest barrier. We need segregated cycling infrastructure, and yeah, they do do a better job of that overseas. You know, we look at. Um, Especially like Copenhagen, uh, I've been over there a couple of times, and it's, I mean, everyone gets around on the bike. And it's Copenhagen, you know, if you look at it on a world map, it's on the same sort of like latitudinal line. The weather's just as crap out there, is what I'm saying. Yeah, people just get like a massive coat on and crack on with it. And uh, you know, same with Amsterdam, uh, Holland. It's really well known the Netherlands for having you know better infrastructure and just the whole culture of people that will get around that way. And yeah, yeah it's. Changing behavior, behavior change is something that's new to me, right? Do you think that e-bikes will assist that in yeah, the UK? I do, 100%, like, especially in like the north of England where um, geographically it's just hilly, it's hard, it's windy, right? You know, if people are going to get to work on a bike, they, don't, they just want it to be like walking fast, effort-wise. Yeah. They don't want to turn up in a big sweaty mess to the, the business meeting with a laptop. And yeah, but they're, they're, again, there's barriers to that infrastructure being one of them, cycling security being another. Um, cost. Yeah, I tell you what, cost is, um, you know, particularly around certain areas. And it's a shame that like, there's certain postcodes in South Yorkshire, right? 70% of people don't have access to a car let alone own a car themselves, right? So we know that, you know, South Yorkshire is working on having better public transport, you know, trying to sort out the tram in Sheffield, trying to sort out the buses and so on. Because um, that's going to really help the people that can't afford cars. Yeah. But the problem is if they can't afford cars, they can't afford an e-bike either. They're expensive. Yeah. And... Um, I don't know what we're looking at for an half decent e-bike. You'd want to commute on grand and half. Yeah, easy. Mm, <clears throat> it's difficult selling it when you can get a car for 500 quid. Yeah, yeah. You can get a car for 500 quid, insure it, tax it, MOT it. You know, it probably won't cost you a grand, well, maybe two grand a year by the time you put petrol in it and so on. But um, So what's the solution? Oh, well, I'm looking into that. I'm trying hard. It's a difficult one though, but... Um, I'm trying hard to make these e-bikes more accessible and um, I can't really announce what it is I'm trying to do about it yet, but I'm trying to look at solutions. I mean, there's already this sort of like the ride to work scheme and things like that. Yeah. But that only works if you're getting paid a decent wage. What if you're not? Like there's, um, so, so if, you're, uh, if you're in central London making 200 grand a year in the 50% tax bracket, you can go buy a, whatever it is, the top of the range e-mountain bike, uh, road bike, whatever it is to commute to work on. They're essentially getting it at half price, right? Because yeah. you get the tax back on it. You're not paying any tax at all. No benefit. No. So this ride to work scheme doesn't work or as a, a very marginal benefit You know, to some of the folks that need it most, that some of the folks that can't afford cars and they probably don't have the best public transport in and around them mm. 
to do that. Again, like talking about public transport, I mean, look at like London is, um, I've, I've drove into London, I'm ashamed to say, in the last um, year. It's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> you know what I mean, like nobody in the right mind would do it yeah. when you can like uh, get a train in, get on your line bike, bosh across. It's quicker, it's easier. There's no stress. You can do work on your laptop. It's a complete way forward, but it's more difficult, you know, when things are spread out like they are. We have like little villages, little towns that have got a bit more distance between them, but it's not impossible to make progress. We're not looking for perfection, are we? We're just looking for progress. Could bikes ever be subsidized? Yeah. 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 Because that I, I can't see any other way in which it can become more affordable unless there's a additional government incentives that's not a, a tax relief. Yeah, I, mean, I think they're doing it, aren't they, elsewhere? Is it Germany that's... Um, I think Germany... Sub, I think. They're always take, forward thinking on things like that. Yeah. Um, don't take this as gospel, folks, but I think Germany are, are doing something like that. Um, Interest-free loans and stuff yeah. to try and enable people. And again, like... Uh, from what I understand, like you know, e-bike sales on the continent has been massive, massive growth. Yeah, in uh, in some countries in Europe, mainland Europe. But um, the other area that I think would really help would be the maintenance side of e-bikes, because we're starting to see a big second-hand market in e-bikes, and yeah. the problem with that is, that, yes, you might then be able to afford a second-hand e-bike. But when the motor packs up, you've got no warranty to, to support you. And there's often yeah. there's nowhere local to you where you could go to take that motor to, to get it fixed or replaced. Mm. And so I think if there was upskilling in people to be able to service them, uh, if there were mountain bike service centers or road bike service centers, places like that where you could be like, let's let's just get it fixed there. Yeah. Um, that would definitely incentivize people to perhaps buy second hand. Mm. Um, that's yeah. another area I think, I think you're right I think that's a big part of the worry isn't it people um, I think the, the reality is especially now with the modern e-bikes I think that people worry that after you know three four five years these things that just aren't going to be useful anymore but I think unless you're like absolutely hammering them like every day jet washing them like uh, up <laughs> close and personal and, and so on uh, they, they will last a long time but it's definitely a concern. I mean, to be fair, I know a lot of people that have had e-bikes that um, have needed warranty, have needed replacement batteries, motors, and so on. But yeah, and to kind of, ex I really think, and I don't have a solution for this, but I think there's a gap in the market for like a Henry Ford of e-bikes. Do you know what I mean? When the motor, when the motor car came out, it was like this elusive and exclusive thing that only like the rich and famous could afford. And sure. then of course they, Henry Ford came out with a car for the people, right? And you could fix it with a hammer and it cost 10 quid. I'm exaggerating, right? But I do think if there was a sort of modern day equivalent where it was good quality, yeah, don't have to be exceptional, but it was easy to fix by uh, Joe Public. You could take it to the, the car garage, to a, a local handyman to sort of fix. You know, it wasn't like a sealed unit that was um, put together with microchips that you've you've got to work with elon musk to understand like how these things are sort of um calibrated yeah, yeah. and um the the, the uh, word that often gets mentioned now is a sealed unit mm. so it's it, you literally buy a sealed unit which yeah. cannot be opened there's a there's a bike brand in italy called Polini, and uh, it's a motor manufacturer and they uh have have prioritize the fact that you can service them at home yeah. and so they you can buy parts of the motor so when they go wrong you take a picture of the, the internals of the motor and hopefully you can fix it and they'll send you the part out yeah. um, that that to me is the future of of uh, sustainable e-bikes yeah uh, i don't think many manufacturers will take that same approach but it's quite refreshing to see that that is an option uh, albeit possibly a more premium option yeah, that's good to see. Is it Polini, you said? I've been involved in like motor, motorbike racing mm. in the past, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good to see um, Good to see that. And I think you're right. And you know, you were, mentioned the word sustainability there. <laughs> like, I'll tell you what, I've been hit with this a couple of times. You know, I've been banging on about how great e-bikes are. And people say, well, they're not as good as an analog bike for the environment. 
And yeah, you're right. It's not going to be as good as a, an analog bike for the environment. But bloody hell, if you compare it to any other way of getting around, yeah, it's negligible, isn't it? You yeah. know, like, um, f- f- I've I've done a bit of man maths on this. I've got a hybrid car that's on the drive, right? And you know, when it's plugged up and it's fully charged around the roads of South Yorkshire, around here, it'll um, you know do about thirty three miles on its uh, twelve kilowatt thing, and you know, on the e-bike, which has a half kilowatt, 500 watt hour battery, half kilowatt, it'll do like 100 miles. And point being is that the e-bike is 35 times or something more efficient than the car. Sure. And um, being a Yorkshireman, I also like the fact that it costs 16 pence to charge. <laughs> you know, it's just like, how can you get from like Manchester, or Sheffield and back um, for like eight pence each way? Love it. I, you know, and you feel like half decent about yourself. You don't have to sit in traffic. And honestly, like door to door, <laughs> by the time you've parked up and walked in or whatever, it takes about 12 minutes longer. Yeah. And I, I, people think oh, that's me giving it the big Olympian. It's not. That's me with a pannier rack on the back in my chinos doing 30 mile an hour uphill, which, you know, your girlfriend would do on an e-bike. And, you know, when it's a flat road, I'll just sit there on the, the speed limiter at 15 mile an hour. Yeah. And obviously downhill, you just don't touch the brakes and you'll do 30, 40, whatever. But, um, I think the, the you can't always focus on the eco aspect of e-bikes and bikes in particular as well. It's it's the the health benefits yeah. that you get from it as well because they're mm. whether it's physical or mental health, uh, the the tool that it is that gives you the access to the outdoors. I think that that can't be measured. Well, it maybe it can be measured, but it's, uh, <laughs> no, you're right. I think uh, there, there has been research done on this, hasn't there? Like. Uh, we, like, we all know this idea that like climate change and um, you know sustainability is dead important, right? We all know that's a fact, but we also know that it's not the most compelling thing to help people change their behaviour. Yeah, um, things like uh, living in a better place, um, saving money, health—that's more compelling to people. Uh, children's safety is a big one, you know, particularly like cars around schools and stuff. And uh, you know, to be fair, if if that's not a concern to people. There's probably <laughs> probably something wrong with them. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, I think the health thing that you mentioned, and one thing, again, I mentioned it earlier in the pod, that, that sort of link to mental health, like everyone has a hard time, everyone struggles, right? I think more should be done to kind of like promote this link between like just doing some activity, you know, and feeling good and happy and healthy in life. I uh, spend a little bit of time in Austria and seeing what they do there and the even the, the footpaths and the cycle tracks that run alongside the rivers. And then every once yeah. in a while, there's a little area where there's a sort of a, a play park, but almost for adults. So, yeah, yeah. you know, there's, <laughs> it, it, it's, I, I can't think of an example, but there's all sorts of things that you can do there along the way. Oh, yeah. And, and you can do sort of uh, exercise workouts on some of the machines that they've got there. Yeah, and yeah. they're just, just out on the side of the hill in yeah. a valley. Somewhere. They go out and the locals use them as well. I've seen those. And um, yeah, and I think it sort of comes back to this infrastructure piece as well, doesn't it? And, um, you know, with this active travel commissioner hat on that I've got, that's one of the biggest cells of, uh, you know, active travel is, you know, when we get hold of a, an old decrepit road and the builders and engineers are going there, they tear it up. And it's got a big segregated bike lane and a big proper uh, walking path next to it with big crossings, sustainable drainage units and all of that stuff. It's a, we create a better place. Yeah. It looks attractive. People want to be there. New businesses open up, cafes. You know, people want to sit there and chill and have a nice time. Property prices go up. We talk about pride in Yorkshire a lot, don't we? Yorkshire pride and being proud of being in Yorkshire and all that. And People want to be proud of where they come from. And I think that's, um, people don't always associate that with riding bikes, but it creates better places. Absolutely. And currently what I see around the UK is not something I can quite be proud of yet. And hopefully that is something that will happen in my lifetime. Yeah, I, I hope so too. Obviously, I mean, like, um, I know I see the world through my own lens, but I, yeah, I really think so. And I think, the problem is it's like achieving anything in life, right? Like going around a bloody track fast on your bike to get to a good end place with something worth achieving. You just have to go through some short term adversity, right? To get there. Yeah. The roads have to be torn up. You know, we have got to upset some people that live there in houses. Business owners aren't 
always going to be happy while projects get done. But that's just life, right? And nobody's achieved anything without putting up with some short-term adversity. And I think we're just going to like lean into that a bit and just be like, hey, you know what? We're going to get there eventually. It's not going to be today or tomorrow, but you know, hopefully if we're prepared to put up with a little bit of misery short-term, we'll get to a better place. It goes back to people being afraid of change. Yeah, it? <laughs> funnily enough, it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true, yeah. Um, I thought I'd briefly touch on your involvement with British Cycling. Mm. So... Uh, you probably don't know this, but I used to own an e-bike rental company. So uh, we had a fleet of electric mountain bikes and uh, I also offered guided rides. So um, I had my British cycling membership because of that. Mm. And uh, since then, I don't run the business anymore, but I've continued with my British cycling membership. Although I'm starting to question why I still have it. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. British Cycling as well, they've now uh, got sort of questionable, questionable involvements with uh, certain other uh, yeah. brands. And mm. what's your view of British Cycling now and what inv- what involvement do you see British Cycling having uh, in the future and in the cycling industry? Yeah, British Cycling, I mean, it's, it's kind of been on this journey, hasn't it? Um, and I've seen it firsthand and it's kind of rose from, you know, relatively small compact thing into a massive machine not just the the great britain cycling team like the high performance end of it just british cycling as a whole organization now british cycling is not immune to um you know the post effects of both covid and this cost of living crisis that we're in. Um, in terms of like where British Cycling is at right now, first of all, like the high performance Olympic team, let's call it. Like if we look at like the recent um, world championships up in Glasgow um, that encompassed like, you know, track cycling, road cycling, mountain biking, uh, mountain bike trials, uh, bicycle football, all of that like the Great Britain cycling team did really, really well. And I have total faith that they'll go on to achieving great things again in Paris and hopefully LA too. Uh, Stephen Park, uh, Sparky, the performance director, is happy with progress. But I tell you what, like they're doing really, really well on a finite amount of people and resource. I kind of... I feel like people in that building feel stretched more than they have done, you know, in in my lifetime in that building. But they're doing really well because of it, Uh, you know, despite it, sorry, they're they're, they're hanging in there, which is great to see. Um, British Cycling as the wider organization has just got a new CEO called John Dutton. Um, John Dutton has sort of commissioned me to run this task force, for example. This task force, we've got um, seven or eight people. We've got business types. We've got um, current cyclists. We've got cycling managers, uh, PR people. So we're trying to turn around um, what's been a, you know, the demise of like the domestic road racing scene. Um, talking about someone who's not adverse to change is John Dutton. I really like him and I like what he did in his work in rugby. Mm. Um, he understands the importance, not just of having like big events, you know, like, um, like a home world championships or like a tour of Britain or whatever. He understands that these events have got to have a, like a lasting legacy. And I know that's been a bit of his speciality in the past as has sort of bringing events together. So I think, I believe what he did really successfully in the world of rugby is he, you know, we kind of had the elite men's side of things, uh, which was always a success. And he kind of brought the elite women together and para sports. And he also created um, sort of lasting legacies with sort of charities and so on, you know, off the back of these massive sporting events. What I'm saying is, I think he's make, he's already making a difference to British cycling uh, in terms of the organisation as a whole. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, if he... I'm not going to say turn the place around because I, I don't think it is in a terrible place. I think he's got every chance to make it um, more successful 
in coming years. I think Sparky's doing a great job on the performance side of things. Um, you know, we've stretched money, stretched resources. And I, I really think that that side of things, they, they're going to do something in Paris, which is going to make the nation proud again. It does seem like women's cycling has suffered. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, domestically, let's be totally, to be frank, um, I know off air, like briefly, we spoke about like the glory days where we kind of like go up and down like the UK and you know, race our bikes for, you know, decent cash, decent races. And, you know, event organizers are struggling to find sponsors, partners, uh, local authorities. You know, we've seen uh, is it Birmingham City Council has struggled recently and it's becoming more and more of a difficult sell for road races to um to find money to find people that have got the time to kind of connect with local authorities the police the barriers there's a lot that goes behind it but um we're, we're trying to find positive solutions but it might take a year or two to you know to make a real step change are more partnerships with companies like shell mm. required in order to get to where you need to be financially yeah, I mean, it's, it's let's, again, let's be dead frank about it. It's been a, a controversial one. And, um, you know, some people see it as like a total misalignment of values. Uh, you know, there's a cycling team uh, partnered up with um, a sort of oil giant. Uh, and obviously there's been a lot of noise in and around that. And then other people will see it as, um, hey, look, like there's there's other teams out there um, there's four or five, I think, you know, professional world tour cycling teams that have um, partnerships, you know, with big oil corporations. Mm -hmm. And so, 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 so some people are sort of sat on the other side of the fence um, where they're kind of like, well, maybe this is just how it has to be. Yeah. Uh, truth be told, in terms of me and my own personal opinion, I haven't really done enough thinking to give you a, a solid answer um but clearly there's pros and cons and i know it's been interesting to see what i, what I can tell you is i have uh, spoke to certain people at shell and you know there's, there's an interest and there's a willingness to learn but um i guess as they say the sort of like you know the proofs in the pudding so yeah who knows what will happen yeah the one thing that we are seeing from the oil companies is they're starting to invest in electric infrastructure. Yeah. Um, whether or not that has a knock-on effect to the world of, say, e-bikes, um, perhaps there's not the government incentives there yet to push them down that route, but um, maybe you know more about that than me. I'm not sure. But wh whether or not they can contribute directly to the bike industry rather than just help fund it, I wonder whether there's a, a route there. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting question. And uh, again, this is probably what I'm not that like, clued up on, but but between them, um, you know, the government and the big oil corporations, you know, I don't know enough about it. Uh, what I do know is it's it's a complicated thing and we can't, from what I understand, we can't just stop oil overnight, right? Um, but I do think we've got to start working towards that and there's got, there's got to be a, a movement and a need and again, you know, what I said earlier about to get to a better place, we've got to have to go through some short-term adversity to get there. Mm. I don't know, I think we've somehow got to have a willingness to do that as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is not easy, right? No, it's a long Cost road. Cost of living crisis. Um, yeah, I think timing's probably key. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, um, it is a long road and these things don't happen overnight. Um, but the fact that you are involved and you're, it's, yeah. it's refreshing to see someone who's got enthusiasm to make change and a new focus, a new direction for you, you yourself personally. Mm. And it's, it's just, for me, it's refreshing to have people like yourself in a, a policy-making environment because I think Chris Boardman being a great example yeah, of somebody yeah. who has, has channeled their competitive abilities into now yeah. political yeah boardman he's, he's always been an inspiration uh, for me and my life in one way or another i remember when i was a kid and um i saw this fella like rocking around on this like <laughs> big lotus super bike yeah it's probably one of the reasons i've got a bit of a strange obsession with bikes and technology now is um 
seeing him in my you know really early days and then yeah when I was an athlete you know big part of the, the success of the Great Britain cycling team was down to this whole like marginal gains thing right mm. and um Chris was like heading up the team before Beijing you know he was um kind of coordinating the program and I think it's fair you could call Chris a, a disruptor right yeah he's definitely one that he's not one that'll just follow the rule book and sort of say, right, well, this is the way things have been done. So this is the way we're going to do them. He's more than happy to be inquisitive and ask, um, not difficult questions, but he, he questions systems and processes and, uh, current ways of thinking, yeah. which is exactly what he does in active travel. Right. His job is to question like the, the status quo, the, cu the current norm and say, well, maybe there's something better out there. And, you know, as Chris puts it, he says, um, he sees active travel as like this silver bullet that's going to reduce pollution, reduce congestion, reduce the burden on the NHS, increase people's life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you know, even now in my life, and you know, it's a totally different walk of life, he's um, still still leading the way and still a shining example to me. Yeah. Yeah. Probably right. should tell him that at some point. You should, shouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're listening, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's another question. I need to uh, need to find out how I can get Chris on the podcast because he stopped replying to my text messages. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, to get a reply out of him in the first place, it's good, it's good on you. Yeah. <laughs> he's uh, clearly a very busy man. You tell you what, he's really busy. And he's, um, again, like, uh, I've only like sat down with him at, uh, sort of two or three occasions, really, and had like a proper chat about, active traveling like this world but i tell you what he's just um he's a smart fella and he's constantly thinking and yeah and if you look back over his history and all the projects he's worked on he's um an interesting guy yeah. but he's he's very busy <clears throat> like he's just a machine yeah definitely yeah well i can see that you're going to be kept very busy over the next uh couple of years so ho yeah, well, hopefully that should be a, a good good uh, focus for you in the future yeah, I hope so. I think this active travel thing, it's, um, I was with the team yesterday and it's, honestly, it's, it's the, the role that I never saw it like coming. You know, I always like thought I'd somehow end up working with British Cycling still and I'm glad I am. And I always figured I'd do like a bit of public speaking about my past and you know, ambassador jobs and things like that, which you know, I'm very proud to do. And as you know, I, I only like work with people that I want to work with and uh, the active travel thing is almost like one of these things in retirement I never knew I needed. And it's been mint. I love working with the team. I love seeing the world from a different view, a different perspective. And it's given me a love of cycling again that I lost. Yeah, it, it, It's not like a being a professional athlete was the best way I could have misspent my youth. But like just seeing like uh, leisure cycling, commuting again, um, with like fun, freedom, independence, all that same stuff that I started with as a kid has really kind of brought it full circle. And um, yeah, I love that world. So I'm very happy to be involved. Oh, the, uh, the one last thing that we didn't mention, I, has that completely come to an end or uh, the idea of the e-bike racing in London? Well, it, it seems to have done for now, yeah. So I've been involved in this. Um, basically, the idea was we have town centre criterium racing but we do it on e-bikes, de-restricted. And for me, I just thought they'd be dead exciting. It was a project I was dead keen to be involved with. So it, town centre racing, you have you know, 40, 50 guys racing around a big town centre, a kilometre circuit, flat out for an hour. Yeah. If you added in e-bikes, they'd be faster. It'd have another layer of sort of tactics to the, the race. You know, where do you deploy your battery? If you've got, assuming you've got a finite amount of energy for okay. the race. You can't just run it like full turbo from start to finish. So it's like where, when, how do you deploy the battery? Mm. And, you know, could have a big team format like we've seen in the sort of tour series races in the past. And, um, yeah, I, I even thought like a bit like the British touring cars, you could sort of like handicap if there was riders yeah. or teams that are running away Success with it. Success ballast. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, they, they're kind of waiting on funding to come in. So for now, the project's on ice. But I sincerely hope that that picks up and takes off again because uh, I'd love to be involved in that one. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds interesting. And it's like it creates a spectacle of something that currently doesn't exist. Yeah, so. exactly. And I think in terms of like promoting e bikes to the masses, you know, I almost be like, um, world rally cars in the 90s where we used to see Colin McRae and Richard Burns driving the Subarus and you know and, and then people wanted that as their road cars even though it's a very different thing and I think it could be um, the sort of 
I don't know, it's something aspirational that sort of draws people in. Mm. But then also there's like a, an offering for the public to a sort of a daily commuting bike or a racing bike or whatever it is. And um, I just thought it was a cool project and I hope it kicks off again. Yeah, no, it sounds amazing. And uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to see all the, the irons that you've got in many fires. So uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what might come of it. Ah, cheers, um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, being on the podcast. I mean, it's quite unlikely to get a, a Olympic track cyclist to come on an, a, an e-bike podcast, but um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, hopefully we'll also get the opportunity to ride e-bikes together again soon. I hope so. Yeah, cheers for having me, Ben. I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks very much. Nice one. Thanks a lot. Yeah.